Good afternoon, and I'd like to welcome our guests at the back, uh, visiting uh, students from Baruch College. Welcome, and I, I hope you enjoy today's briefing. Uh, just to remind you, the Secretary General today chaired the biannual session of the UN System Chiefs e Executives Board for Coordination at the Green Tree Estate in Manhasset, New York. That meeting continues tomorrow. CEB members will reflect on current world affairs as they affect and relate to the UN system. And they will engage in deliberations on a new agenda for peace and on reclaiming the digital commons. The UN Environment Program today released its emission gap, emissions gap report, which says that the international community is still falling far short of the Paris goals with no credible pathway to 1.5 degrees Celsius in place. Under current policies, the world is headed for 2.8 degrees of global heating by the end of the century. In a message on the report, the Secretary General said that we are headed for a global catastrophe unless we take action. And he urged countries to end our reliance on fossil fuels, avoid a lock-in of new fossil fuel infrastructure, and invest massively in renewables. Our world cannot afford any more greenwashing, fake movers, or late movers, he said, adding that we must close the emissions gap before climate catastrophe closes in on us all. The Special Coordinator for Lebanon, Ioana Renetska, warmly welcomed today the handover of letters delineating the maritime border between Lebanon and Israel following successful U.S. mediation under the leadership of Special Presidential Coordinator Amos Hochstein. She said that this is a historic achievement at many levels. Ms. Vranesca hopes it will serve as a confidence-building measure that promotes more security and stability in the region and economic benefits for both countries. The special coordinator received the signed maritime coordinates from both countries at the UNIFIL premises in Nakura today. She will deposit the documents at the UN headquarters in New York. Since the adoption of the framework agreement that launched the negotiation process in 2020, the United Nations has been working with both countries and the United States to put an end to their maritime boundary dispute. Highlighting the need for sustainable peace and security, the Special Coordinator reiterated the importance of the full implementation of Security Council Resolution 1701 and other relevant resolutions. In a statement we issued last night, the Secretary General strongly condemned the terrorist attack that took place earlier in the day on the Shah Chirag Holy Shrine in the Iranian city of Shiraz, for which the so-called Islamic State can claim responsibility. Such acts targeting religious sites are especially heinous. The Secretary General stresses the need to bring to justice the perpetrators of this crime against civilians exercising their right to practice their religion. This morning, the Security Council held a meeting on the situation in Sudan and South Sudan. Briefing Council members on the UN Interim Security Force for Abye, Martha Amaakya Pobi, the Assistant Secretary General for Africa in the Departments of Political and Peacebuilding Affairs and Peace Operations, noted that while progress has yet to materialize in the form of improvements in the lives and rights of the people of Abye, there have been, several, there have been significant steps towards dialogue in the context of continued improvement in the relationship between the Sudan and South Sudan. Ms. Pobi pointed out that while the security situation in the Abye administrative area remained mostly calm, there's been some shift in the conflict dynamic seen in previous years. She said that they are particularly concerned that amid the tensions between the Ngok Dinka and Twik Dinka communities, there have been attacks and threats against the UN peacekeepers, staff, and contractors. Also briefing council members, Hana Siruatete, the special envoy for the Horn of Africa, noted that progress in improving bilateral relations between Sudan and South Sudan has positive and stabilizing effects in the Horn of Africa. Yet, she said, renewed commitment regarding the implementation of transitional arrangements and the dispute resolution over Abye's final status cannot be set apart from the fragile internal situations in both countries. Ms. Tete added that this is also true for any prospects of resolving the conflict in the Blue Nile and South Kordofan. Both remarks have been shared with you. And as you know, yesterday, Miguel de Serpa Suarez, the Under Secretary General for Legal Affairs and United Nations Legal Counsel, briefed council members on Ukraine and his remarks have been shared with you. This afternoon, the Security Council will also hold an open and a closed meeting on Ukraine. At the DJ Ebo, 
the director and deputy to the High Representative for the United Nations Office of Disarmament Affairs, is expected to brief council members. The Director General of the International Atomic Energy Agency, Rafael Mariano Grossi, will brief reporters at the Security Council stakeout following the council's meeting on threats to international peace this afternoon. We have an update from our peacekeeping colleagues in the Democratic Republic of the Congo who report that heavy fighting is, is continuing between the M23 armed group and Congolese national forces in the Ruchuru area of North Kivu. The clashes follow a series of attacks by the armed group on villages in the area, which prompted the Congolese armed forces to respond and, with the support of UN peacekeepers, protect the communities being targeted. The mission is reporting that at least nine civilians were killed yesterday during clashes near communities living around 8 to 16 kilometers from Ruchuru. The mission continues to work closely with security forces to deter armed groups and is engaging with political actors at national and regional levels to contribute to the restoration of peace and stability. The mission is also calling for an end to the violence, which humanitarian partners estimate has now displaced an additional 34,500 people. The UN mission in the Central African Republic continues to pursue efforts to address disinformation campaigns which hinder mandate implementation including through building the capacity of local media professionals and monitoring hate speech. The mission also supported the launch of a new phase in the recruitment drive for internal security forces as candidates participated in written tests. At a gendarmerie camp in Bangui, the mission, joined, jointly with the UN Development Program, handed over equipment to the Ministry of the Interior and Public Security. Since last week, the mission carried out 1,375 patrols, including two jointly with the National Armed Forces in Ipi, in the Waka Prefecture, and in Bria, in the Hot Koto Prefecture. Robust patrolling in villages along the border with the Democratic Republic of the Congo, as well as in other areas in the East and the Center region, helped improve the security situation and facilitate the resumption of socioeconomic activities. From Cameroon, our humanitarian colleagues report that floods in the country's far north region that began in August this year have affected some 150,000 people. The flooding is continuing. Thousands of people have been displaced, including people arriving from Chad, who are also affected by the rising waters of the Lagone River that flows through northern Cameroon. Our partners are supporting the government's efforts, including providing food and other essentials such as mattresses, plastic sheeting and blankets, and construction material to repair the dikes. To assist the people in need, our partners urge donors to contribute to the 2022 Humanitarian Response Plan, which needs $360 million and is less than 33% funded at the moment. The World Health Organization today released a report showing that an estimated 10.6 million people fell ill with tuberculosis in 2021, an increase of 4.5% from 2020. According to the report, 1.6 million people died from TB in 2021, including 187,000 HIV-positive people. The burden of drug-resistant TB also increased by 3% between 2020 and 2021. The report notes that this is the first time in many years that an increase has been reported in the number of people falling ill with tuberculosis and drug-resistant TB. WHO points out that services are among many others disrupted by the COVID-19 pandemic in 2021, but its impact on the TB response has been particularly severe. Ongoing conflicts across Eastern Europe, Africa, and the Middle East have further exacerbated the situation for vulnerable populations. More information online. And today is the World Day for Audiovisual Heritage, which this year will be celebrated in conjunction with the 30th anniversary of the Memory of the World program. The celebration will take place from today, the 27th of October, till the 5th of November, 2022, under the theme, Enlisting Documentary Heritage to Promote Inclusive, Just, and Peaceful Societies. More information on UNESCO's website. And after I'm done, you'll hear from Paulina Kubiak, the spokesperson for the President of the General Assembly. And at 1.15 p.m., there will be a hybrid briefing by the UN Independent International Commission of Inquiry on the occupied Palestinian territory, including East Jerusalem and Israel. Navi Pillay, the chair, along with members Milun Kutari and Chris Sidoti, will be here to brief. Then tomorrow at 11 a.m., there will be a hybrid briefing by the International Commission of Human Rights Experts on Ethiopia. Betty Marungi, the chair, along with Radhika Kumaraswamy and Stephen Ratner. At 12.30 p.m., there will be a hybrid briefing by the president of the International Court of Justice, Judge Joan E. Donahue, 
and the registrar of the court, Philippe Gautier. And at 1.15 p.m., there will be another hybrid briefing by Michael Fakri, Special Rapporteur on the Right to Food, Balakrishna Rajagopal, Special Rapporteur on, the adequate, on Adequate Housing as a Component of the Right to an Adequate Standard of Living, and on the Right to Non-Discrimination in this Context, and Olivier de Schutter, Special Rapporteur on Extreme Poverty and Human Rights. So that's a busy schedule for tomorrow. Yes, uh, James. Uh, we had a briefing, as you said, um, I'm following up on two things that you said, um, by the legal counsel, Suarez, um, giving details of past president of, of the SG ordering investigations about alleged breaches of Resolution 2231. He also addressed the whole issue of Article 100 and didn't seem to think that these investigations in any way breached um, Article 100. He didn't seem to suggest there were any legal hurdles now um, for the SG to launch an investigation into claims that Iranian drones have been used by Russia in Ukraine. So is the SG going to launch such an investigation? I don't have anything further to say uh, to what the legal counsel said yesterday. I think that remains our, our, authoritative, our authoritative stand on uh, this issue, uh, and we continue to be guided by, uh, by the member states. So if there are no legal hurdles, then the only reason for the Secretary General not to do this would be he was cowed by threats of non-cooperation by Russia? I think that's an opinion rather than... Uh, any particularly um, uh, 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 factual claim. Uh, I believe that uh, we as we go about our work, we rely on the information that we receive from member states, and, and we will continue to do that in this case. But, but uh, uh, Miguel de Serpa Suarez made clear what our position is on this issue. One other follow-up from one of the other things you were reading out today, um, the very worrying um, um, UN Environment Programme Emissions Gap Report. Um, Clearly, the Secretary General wants leading countries to do all they can on this. Is the Secretary General disappointed at the UK, which staged the last COP, now announcing the new UK Prime Minister Rishi Sunak will not be going to Sham? Uh, earlier, the government had said that King Charles, who's been an environmental champion for very many years, um, seemed to be prevented, but they said he wouldn't be going uh, to to Sharm either. Um, is, the, is, is the Secretary General um, concerned that the UK is dropping this issue and it's, it's, it's champion of this issue? Well, different countries, uh, different member states, have, uh, of course, the sovereign right to determine who represents them at these events. The Secretary General actually spoke to the BBC uh, extensively on climate change yesterday, and he made clear that he's not concerned about which leaders do or do not show up as long as uh, all of the negotiators are there and, and are willing to negotiate uh, uh, in good faith uh, on, on the highest uh, possible standards that can be set. And so that is what he's looking forward to. And we'll see which leaders come around. Of course, this is a process that we expect uh, governments to go through in the coming uh, days. Yes. yes uh, thank you, Farhan. Uh, about Iran, uh, in the past 24 hours, the wave of protests intensified, especially in the city of Mahabad, and there has been reports of death of protesters, wounded, and uh, this is the same case in some other parts of Iran. What is the Secretary General's position about this? Well, I mean, you, you've seen what we've had to say. Uh, we, we support the right to peaceful protest. We support the right to peaceful assembly. Uh, we remain concerned about the reports of rising numbers of fatalities uh, related to the large-scale protests in the country. And we're also concerned about continued reports of excessive use of force. And we call on the security forces to refrain from using disproportionate force to avoid further casualties. Just, just follow up on that. My question was about the killing of the protesters. You, you talk about the right to protest. And you know, it, it's interesting that Secretary General issued a statement about the terrorist attack in Shiraz to condemn it very strongly. But when I'm asking you about the death of protesters, there's no word, or no condemnation. Well, then let me be clear. We, we condemn any violence that kills civilians, full stop. Uh, when there are civilians engaged in peaceful protest, that should not happen. And any killing of, of uh, protesters needs to be thoroughly investigated. Uh, who are you condemning in those killings? Wh whoever perpetrates them, of course. 
uh, like I said, uh, if, if if in this case, again, and I've said that we're concerned about the disproportionate use of force, if, if just if disproportionate and excessive force has been used against protesters, that has to be thoroughly investigated and, and uh, there has to be accountability. Just one more. Your special rapporteur, you just 20 minutes, right on that chair, said the Iranian governments are responsible for this uh, killing of protesters. So why not name Iran and the, its government? I, the, the rapporteur speaks under his, uh, his own authority and, and is, is fully entitled to do so. I, I've said what our position is on this. Uh, yes. Um, thank you, Farhan. Uh, two questions. First, um, is the Secretary General pl or any other high UN officials planning to meet with the IAE director, Mr. Grossi, while he's in the building today? Uh, the Secretary General and indeed most of the senior officials are not in the building today. They're at uh, the Green Tree Estates in Manhattan, uh, in Manhasset, for the um, for the uh, uh, Chief Executive's board meeting. So he will not be available to meet with them. Um, secondly, um, Martin Griffiths expressed uh, some optimism yesterday that the grain deal would be renewed when it expires in mid-November, but Russia's UN ambassador said later um, that there would be no decision until there was progress on the Russian side of the deal, and so far there had been no progress. Um, we have never really gotten any kind of a briefing on implementation of the Russian side of the deal, which um, the Secretary General basically uh, gave to uh, Rebecca Greenspan to see if she could make progress. Is there, I'm sure all of us would like to get some independent confirmation of what actually is happening, has happened on implementing the Russian side of the deal. Yes, and, and we've tried to provide a, some updates about Rebecca Greenspan's work, including her travels. And, and she has spoken at, uh, at this briefing uh, uh, in recent months. The, the difficulty is that unlike the Black Sea Grain Initiative, where we can provide very precise information about numbers of ships, uh, quantities of cargo being moved, uh, it's difficult to, to put a number on the, uh, the freeing up of Russian exports and how regulations are being uh, treated in different countries. She is working with different countries and, and has been making progress. We'll see whether we can get her to talk to you again at a time when it's practical, but she has been continuing with her efforts, including in travels, as you know, to Moscow, as, as of course, has Mr. Griffiths. Yes, and, and she did talk to us, but when she talked to us, we also got basically no information. Well, well, I'm sorry well, to say on, I, on the status of the Russian side of the deal. Again, what she's dealing with is something that's harder to quantify. You can't point to things and say, this is what's happened. Because a lot of it involves talking to governments and dealing with them on how they will inf enforce uh, their own regulations relating to exports and how they will deal with the issues that arise from exports uh, coming out of Russia. Uh, she does believe that she's made progress. I, I believe she's even indicated as much in this room. It's just, it's just uh, hard to, uh, it's just hard to f uh, put that into concrete facts and figures. Uh, yes. Thank you. I'm Nato Lutsenko from Ukraine ICTV station. Just a follow-up speaking about the Black Sea Grain Initiative. Is there any information about this um, export of Russian fertilizers through the Ukrainian territory? I mean, this pipeline from Taliati, Odessa. Thank you. Uh, and did the, uh, Mr. Griffiths talk to Ukrainian government so far? I'll, I'll need to check with uh, Mr. Griffith's office whether this is something that uh, that he has uh, checked up, uh, discussed with the the Ukrainians. Uh, but uh, certainly, we are we are working 
to uh, uh, both uh, to move grain out of the Black Sea and to move uh, Russian fertilizer out uh, to other areas, and, and we're trying to make progress on both fronts. Uh, yes, Petun. Thanks, Farhan. I'll follow up on Martin uh, Griffiths and his visit with U.S. Secretary of State, uh, Anthony Blinken. We did not get a readout. I'm just wondering, after his meeting, if uh, Mr. Griffiths uh, talked to the SG, and I assume that uh, Mr. Griffiths discussed a grain deal with the Americans, because as far as we know, the UN is in touch with the US, EU, and other Western countries to facilitate the exports of Russian grain and fertilizer. And did he ask for any assurances from uh, the US government, from Secretary Blinken, uh, to facilitate the Russian exports of fertilizer and its grains? Well, Mr. Griffiths continues to work uh, productively with uh, his U.S. counterparts on a number of issues, including on moving ahead with the Black Sea Grain Initiative. And, and yes, uh, he does uh, keep the Secretary General apprised of all his contacts. Uh, Evelyn. Thank you, Farhan. <clears throat> Back to the Iranian drone controversy. Um, you mentioned that it was up to member states uh, after you had the discussion on the uh, legal, the legal, mm -hmm. um, well, the legal position. Um, what did you mean that it was up to member states? Which member states? Where? Well, uh, I mean, the, the simple fact is that uh, that on this on this particular matter, as as with so many, uh, we're guided by the information we receive from member states, and that that. It, that basically refers to all of them. You're not looking at a particular particular body? No. Uh, Gregory? Thank you, Farhan. Uh, the Russian ambassador to the UN uh, sent a letter to the Secretary General uh, uh, with a request to provide an answer. Uh, does the request of individual members of the Security Council to launch uh, an investigation uh, of alleged violation of uh, Resolution 2241 by Russia and Iran, uh, does it consist of violation of uh, Article 100 of UN Charter? And so, did you receive this letter? What's the reaction? Uh, I think on that, uh, I have nothing further to say than what the legal counsel said yesterday. We, we shared what his remarks are, and, and you can refer back to those. Uh, yes, Mr. Abedi. Thank you, Farhan. Following the agreement and the signature of the maritime agreement between Lebanon and uh, Israel, Hezbollah's head, Nasrullah, said that his troops stopped mobilizing. Does the Secretary General welcome this as a measure destined to lessen tension in the area? Uh, Certainly, the Secretary General welcomes uh, the agreement uh, reached on the maritime boundary. I, I actually expect we might have something more formal to say from the Secretary General side later this afternoon on that. Yes, please. Thank you, Farhan. Um, yesterday, uh, we heard here um, uh, Tom Andrews about Myanmar. And uh, at the same time, the same hours, there were uh, um, Volker Turk, uh, Nolin Hazer say practically the same thing. That the world he is practically has forgotten, forgot about Myanmar. Now, from your presentation, we understand also why there are many crises. But question is, uh, what the Secretary General think about uh, the missing of a, of a strong pressure to the military junta by by the members of the United Nations? Uh, I, I don't agree that the world has forgotten about Myanmar. It's very clear that at a time of many different crises, uh, that uh, that un unfortunately, the nations of the world have not made as much progress as we need to have made about Myanmar. But we continue uh, to, uh, to call for the restoration of the elected government and uh, the freeing of all political detainees. We continue to work on that through our envoy, Noelian Hazer. And we'll continue to push with that. And, uh, and we hope that all nations, and indeed all of the regional organizations, will continue to push for, for this goal. Um, but Tom, sorry, a quick follow-up. But Tom Hendricks say here, 
that what was done at the moment was too weak, was not, was not working. And uh, he suggested that the organization and the state members should react to the situation in Myanmar similar to the way that they react on the situation in Ukraine, find new way to sanction and also go through the General Assembly with a new resolution. What do you think about that? Uh, that that's, that's his opinion to which he's entitled. Uh, I, I would say on this uh, that the situations in Ukraine, which is uh, a, a conflict created in one state uh, by another state, and the situation uh, in Myanmar, where you've had uh, a regime uh, unseat an elected government are two different situations. Yes. Uh, yeah, uh, so this is a um, slightly unusual one. Um, and it relates to, um, I'm going back in history now, um, to Prince Potemkin, uh, who was the advisor, minister, and lover of Catherine the Great. His final resting place was St. Catherine's Cathedral in Kherson. Um, it's now reported that his body has been exhumed and taken to Russia. Does the UN have a reaction? Uh, I've also been apprised of these rumors. I'm not aware of what the factual basis is. Uh, certainly, uh, the cultural heritage of different countries should be kept intact. And, uh, and they should not uh, be desecrated or removed. Uh, whether this has happened or not, uh, we would need to get more factual information on, however. Is that something UNESCO would deal with? Who, uh, uh, the lead agency in charge of the preservation of cultural heritage is, in fact, UNESCO. You're right about that. And with that, Paulina Kubiak, come on up.